Hello and welcome. Let me get my glasses on. I'm Steve Clemens, Editor-at-Large at The Hill. Thanks for joining us today for our Future of Jobs Summit. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Nokia, for making this timely event and these discussions possible. While the events of layoffs and furloughs caused by the COVID pandemic are certainly going to shape the foreseeable future, the long-term prog prognosis for the American workforce will largely be determined by a revolution in communications, data, automation, and other factors. The pandemic helped spark a mass shift to digital, digital tools and communications that will accelerate the deployment and embrace of new tech platforms powered by big data, Internet of Things, IoT, 5G, and AI. Um, this transition comes packed with opportunities and risks for the American workforce that will reward those fluent in these new modalities and will require others to upskill to align with the new opportunities that this future will generate. We've got a fantastic lineup of seekers to help us discuss what resources we need to successfully bridge this period and bring back jobs and the economy. Before we get underway, a few housekeeping notes. You can tweet us at, at the Hill Events, that's at the Hill Events, with the hashtag, hashtag the Hill Jobs. It's very easy. We're broadcasting live. We'll take your questions throughout the program. And if you experience any trouble with your live stream, just push refresh and I'm sure it will all be okay. With that, our first guest is my friend Zoe Baird, the president and CEO of the Markle Foundation. The foundation leads the Rework America Alliance, a nationwide collaboration to enable unemployed and low-wage workers to emerge stronger from the pandemic. Zoe, it's great to see you. I, and I, was, I was hoping we were going to be able to talk today. Let me just ask it's you, you know, we you. have seen so many changes in, I guess, the social contract over work and the workplace. Some horrifying things revealed, like, you know, the way a pandemic hits America, hits it very unevenly, hits, you know, black and brown communities, hits very, you know, very uh, uh, previously impacted communities worse. But it's also given us more nimbleness, you know, in how we think about connecting to work through uh, technology platforms. You know, I know that you've been thinking about this topic for, for a very long time. What are, the, what are the parts of the story that worry you that we need to fix? And what are the parts of the story we should be heartened by? Well, Steve, thanks for having me with you and for the program you're doing today because it's so important. Um, as workers are coming back into the labor market from the pandemic, they are finding a labor market that's permanently changed. The, the kinds of things that you referenced in the digital economy have really been accelerated uh, by the pandemic, whether it's from e-commerce or remote work uh, for those who are able to work remotely. And it's really hammered low-wage workers who, as you note, are heavily people of color. And I would also note with a limited post-secondary education, and that's a key part of this. Um, there are about 5.8 million workers from low-wage roles unemployed who don't have a four-year college degree um, and that's about 63 percent of the unemployed in February. So it's a big part of the challenge that we have and a very significant part of those are people who are black and brown. Um, I would also note that other jobs are also being disrupted as we move to a clean energy economy. So we have other objectives other than the rapid deployment of a digital economy that is um, affecting people's opportunities. You are leading this Rework America Alliance, and I know that our current uh, uh, Secretary of the Veterans Administration, Dennis McDonough, was an, one of the people that helped you work in this arena. What are the big highlights of that alliance? And you know, can you share with our audience where they can go to learn more about what you're putting on the table to help uh, these workers that are struggling right now? Sure. Um, the Rework America Alliance, we formed at the time of COVID, as you said, we'd already been working on these challenges of getting people into better jobs. And the alliance is made up of civil rights organizations like mm. the National Urban League and Unidos US and right. National Partnership for Women and Families. It's made up of big companies, Microsoft, Zurich, CVS. It's made up of nonprofit organizations. And what we're really focusing on are um, two things that matter a lot. One is that people who have lost their jobs have a lot of experience that's needed in the marketplace. 
For example, people who've been hotel customer service representatives have the consumer relations and basic computer skills that make them great candidates for growing fields like IT support specialists. So mm. we're working to get employers to hire people from this broader labor pool of people who don't have the traditional experience or the traditional um, degrees from which they've hired in the past. And there's a lot of interest in, by employers in diversifying their labor market, and they understand the need. So we're really trying to push this hard. Uh, an, another area of our work, which is just enormously important, is um, we need to invent the adult training system of the digital economy. Hmm. The Biden administration today put out a very bold plan to invest in, in uh, adult training and learning. My own father was a labor leader, and I recall as a girl going to the union hall where the men, and they were all men then, would come in when they were in between jobs and would get training. We really don't have a system today to enable workers to get the training they need so that they can take the skills they have that are enormously valuable in the marketplace, that experience with customers, the things that take a long time to develop, and they can partner that with the new skills that they need. And we'd like to see a lot more uh, training going on in the labor market itself. So those labor management partnerships that unions have done so effectively, right. the um, training by employers themselves in the specific hard skills, if you will, of a job, but um, bringing in people who have so many of the talents and capabilities that are needed. And then as we're beefing up and building out uh, government supported training, we need to do that in public private partnerships so that employers are connected into the training and the investments that the government's making actually lead to better jobs with better wages. I love what you've just shared with us on, on various dimensions of training, but adult training, because really is you're talking a little bit about lifelong education, lifelong training, and really shaking up how we think about credentialing and, you know, matching skills with employment, which is not a topic that gets as much airplay as I think it is. We have a question actually on this from Alan Cobb. He's president and CEO of the Kansas Chamber of Commerce. He says, how do educational institutions from K through 12 to tech and higher ed need to change. So I would just ask you, you know, how can we disrupt this so that we get more of what you think we need to get to? Well, you know, we have been very reluctant to take big steps here. And now I think there is the willingness on the part of employers, many of whom can't get the talent they need. Um, and I could tell you, you know, many jobs where you would think that people be, would be rushing to do those jobs, but um, we we don't know where to look for mm. that talent. So, you know, one of my examples of this and the change of the digital economy and how we need to think about the people who are candidates for these jobs is that the guy who learns to take apart a car engine in his neighbor's garage is a fabulous candidate to repair robots. Hmm. So employers need to understand that. We're in our alliance and others are trying to put a lot of information into the market so that employers can see that there are people that they have not traditionally looked to for jobs who are great candidates and that they are able to then um, understand how to get people in and get them the, the training that they need on the specific right. machine or the specific um, process. Right. So just finally, um, I want to tell our audience that we've known each other for a long time. And, and 20 years ago, uh, you funded the New America Foundation's Fellows Program that was beginning to look at how the internet was going to transform being a lawyer, how it was going to transform being at home, how to transform being a farmer, that it was going to, we were looking at that time about, you know, some of the revolutionary impacts that the internet and, and broadband would bring. We're now at the edge of a 5G world. Are you, uh, do you think, you know, what, what's the best North Star in looking at, you know, another light speed jump uh, in, and what your concerns are about Because you were outlining the digital divide, you know, before anyone else was talking about it, you know, really 20 years ago. 
What, what are the sort of opportunities and divides you see as we sit on another, you know, turbo jump in what we can do with 5G, et cetera? It's a great question, Steve. One of the areas where I think uh, we haven't looked hard enough is the potential to create more good jobs from 3D printing. This mm. is a trillion dollar industry. This is an industry where we're making entire drones by 3D printing. It enables us to bring manufacturing back to the U.S. without the high costs of shipping and imports because we can do this anywhere and it's much lower cost production. So we really need to be thinking about new technologies like 3D printing, advanced manufacturing, um, which can generate more good jobs if we have effective policy making with the government and business thinking together at the front end of the commercialization of these technologies, rather than waiting solely till there's a inequity in how these technologies are commercialized and we are looking through the lens of antitrust law or other very um, uh, limited uh, policies. Well, Zoe Baird, President and CEO of the Marco Foundation, I always enjoy our discussions. It's great seeing you today and thank you for applying so much brain power and resources to thinking through these gaps uh, that we have as we approach the jobs of the future. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you, Steve. Thank you.